So today I want to bring you just really, this message is, is really at the heart of it, an important reminder, because I'm going to tell you something you already know, I'm just going to encourage you to do it, okay? And uh, so an important reminder. We, we know about important reminders. Uh, you get those sometimes. Maybe you get a notification on your phone or uh, on your, your smart watch or uh, on your smart device in your house, you get an important notification. Uh, how about when you're on an airplane and you are getting ready to take off? And the flight attendants step up and they begin to give uh, some important reminders. You've seen that before? Everybody in here has probably been on an airplane. Anybody not been on an airplane before? Don't raise your hand. We just assume everybody's been on an airplane before. Or at least you've seen it in the movies. And the flight attendant steps up and they begin to tell you important things. Like, remember, uh, this is where the exit doors are. This is uh, where your flotation devices are. And this is how you buckle your seatbelt. It's really simple, but let me show you how to do it for the 8,000th time. And, and then they get to uh, a part where they say, in the event that the oxygen masks come down, uh, don't worry if it doesn't look like it's inflated. Oxygen is flowing. Please put it where? On yourself before you put it on anybody else. Before you try to help somebody else, Put the oxygen mask on yourself. Well, what if I'm with my spouse? Put it on yourself first. What if I'm with my kids? Put it on yourself first. What if I'm next to a little old lady that she can't do it? Put it on yourself first. What if it's my emotional support animal? Put it on yourself first. Okay? Because whenever you're going to need, if you're going to help somebody, you've got to be helped. If you're not in a state to help, you can't help. You'll be a, a problem, or you'll be in a problem. They'll be living, and you'll be trying to breathe. So get yourself taken care of first before you help anybody else. And I know that doesn't sound like the very Christian thing to do, but let me assure you today, it is very, very Christian to make sure you're taken care of first. Because here's the reality. We live in a world that is perishing. We are. We're living in a world that is on its way, if it doesn't turn to meet Jesus, to a place that starts with H and ends with two L's. That's the reality. It's perishing. And so it's really important to understand that I don't want my family to go there. I don't want my friends to go there. But before I worry about them, I first got to make sure I'm not going there. You know what I mean? Okay, so I've got to get on the right track before I can get other people on the right track. I, the, the most important person in your life, I know, it, I know it sounds weird to say it, but the most important person in your life to make sure they get to heaven is you. You take your little finger like this and point it up and then turn it and point it back to yourself and say, I'm the most important person when it comes to soul winning. I've got to win myself to the Lord before I get anybody else. Now, you say, well, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm going to show you in the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is the apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church. And he says this in verse 25, 1 Corinthians 9. Every athlete, so he's making a metaphor here, and he's talking about something that we know, or that, that this crowd would know, uh, talking about athletes. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Not some things, few things, a couple of things. They exercise it in all things. And they do it to receive a perishable wreath. Now, back then, they had a bunch of games that were comparable to our Olympic games. There was running and jumping and spear throwing and boxing and wrestling. And the people loved these games. If you won one of these sets of games, you were a hero for your town. And every town that held the games gave a different kind of wreath that would go on people's heads, a little crown made of branches and leaves. And it was, uh, if you went to one city, a crown of olive branches. An another city, uh, you'd get a, a wreath made of laurels. If you went to a different city, you'd get something made out of pine. If you went to another city, uh, you would get one made of parsley. Can you imagine? Like, you could take that home and cook with it, I guess. But you would get a, you'd get a wreath depending on what city you were in. And so, you know, some athletes, they'd try to win them all. 
I got all the different wreaths. And, and these were uh, perishable, the Apostle Paul says. They're, they're, they're going through all this self-control. They're going through all this effort, blood, sweat, and tears, putting everything on the line for a perishable wreath. It's going to just dry up and rot and turn to dust, but they go all out for it. Uh, but we, he says, look at the end of verse 25, uh, we are not going after a perishable wreath. We're going after an imperishable wreath, an imperishable crown, as it were. Now he's talking about, watch this in this verse, he talks about first athletes, then he talks about we, us, and then he makes it personal. Look at verse 26. So I, see how that, that changed? It went from, look at all these athletes, now look at us. Now, let me make it personal and talk about me. I do not run aimlessly. I'm not just out running just to run. I don't just go out and exercise until I just feel like, well, that was enough exercise, and then I'm done. No, I'm, I'm running with a point and a purpose and a goal. I've got a time that I need to beat. I'm trying to get better than I was last week. I'm, I'm trying to improve. I'm not running aimlessly. I'm not just doing it for fun. I'm trying to meet a goal. I do not box as one beating the air. I'm not just shadow boxing in my living room. I'm getting in the ring and we're engaging in some combat. I'm sparring. I'm, I'm putting some knuckles on some people and they're putting them back on me because I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where I can compete and win. And he says, so I discipline my body. And I keep it under control. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. I discipline my body and I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Wow. What is he saying? I got to take care of myself first so that I can make sure that I can then take care of you. I've got to get my life in order. I've got to get my affairs in order. I've got to get my priorities in order. I've got to take, put myself under control. I've got to have my own self-discipline or I might be disqualified from the event altogether. Now, when he's talking about self-control, you might be wondering what that entails. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit because these athletes, that, what he's referring to, he's again referring to these games, the uh, Isthmian games. Uh, you have to look it up to find the spelling on it. It's, uh, and so it was, uh, he was referring to this, and he says, look, uh, look at all the self-control they uh, have to do. And so we know what that was. We can go back and, and read from history. There's a, a particular writer named Grotius, and Grotius is quoting somebody else from history, and he, this is what he talks about these athletes uh, in these Olympic games. Just listen as I, I'll read it to you. Uh, he says this, Way, way back then, 2,000 years ago. Do you wish to gain the prize at the Olympic Games? Talking to the, talking to the athletes. You want to be an athlete? You want to gain the prize at the Olympic Games? You want the wreath? Then you need to consider the requisite preparations and the consequence. You realize that if you want to do this, it's going to cost you something. Oh, I thought we were talking about being a Christian, and it's so easy. There is a cost to it. There is a consequence to following Jesus Christ. And you need to weigh that consequence. Because you don't get to do it the way you want to do it. you got to do it the way he says to do it. So there's a consequence. You must observe, Grotius says, a strict regimen. You want to be an athlete? you got to have a strict regimen. You have to live on food which is unpleasant. Okay? You're not going to eat, get to eat what you want to eat. you got to eat you know, good stuff. You must good for you stuff. You know, the stuff that's good for you, you don't, normally don't taste that great either. I don't know why the Lord made us that way, but, you know, I'd rather have a donut than a carrot, but the carrot's better for you. I don't know why. All right. <clears throat> Seems like you would just make donuts good for you. That's a different, different story. Different story. We'll talk about it when we get to heaven. Uh, he says, you must live on food which is unpleasant. You must abstain from all delicacies. You must exercise yourself at the prescribed times, in heat and in cold. In other words, when it's time to exercise, you exercise. You don't get to say, well, it's too hot or it's too cold. Let's wait until it's about 70. No, you go run when it's hot. You go run when it's cold. You just, 
have to do it at the prescribed times. You must drink nothing cool. You must take no wine as usual. You must put yourself under a pugilist as you would under a physician. What is that? What's a pugilist? You know what pugilism is? It's boxing. You got to get yourself a boxing coach who's going to prescribe to you everything to do like a doctor and it's going to be a knuckle sandwich every day. It's, that's what you're getting prescribed. And so you, you got to learn how to be in the ring and taking some punishment and still being able to dish it out. And this is what you have to do. You have to put yourself under somebody that's going to pummel you a little bit. And then, he says, afterward you enter the list. You don't even consider yourself worthy of being a competitor unless you're willing to do all of that. Wow. This is what Paul is talking about when he says, I discipline my body. I put myself under self-control. I don't run aimlessly. I don't box just like one who's beating the air, but I put my body under submission so that I don't get disqualified. I want to compete and I want to win. These athletes, that's what they did. They put their bodies and their minds underneath this heavy sacrifice. And that's a key word there. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. They, they sacrificed because they wanted to win. They wanted to win. They didn't want to just show up and say, I was in the games. They wanted to say, I won the games. I was the fastest. I was the strongest. I was the toughest. I was the victor. That's what they wanted. And so they sacrificed what their bodies would enjoy only temporarily for the joy of having a little glory for the rest of their life. They weighed it out and they said, this is what I want more than temporary satisfaction. And so I disciplined myself to receive this. Now, they went after a perishable crown, a crown of twigs and leaves, maybe some flowers. We, we are in an event that is something you can also win, not something that's going to perish and fade away, but what the Apostle Paul calls an imperishable, uncorruptible crown. And if we're going to get it, we have to put winning first. We have to say, I'm going to win at all costs. What does that mean? I got to make some sacrifice. I got to make some sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? Let's look at it. Galatians 5 and 24. Galatians 5 and 24, again, the Apostle Paul writing, he says this, he says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, those that are in the event, those that are trying to get to heaven, those that are on their way there, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. This is the sacrifice we're talking about. We're not talking about just giving up chocolate for a week or not eating ice cream for a couple of months to drop a few pounds. It's not what we're He said, I want you to crucify your flesh with its passions and its desires. Now, we look at that and say, okay, all right. I see where you're going here. Not sure that I really like it, but I'm, I'm here. You can't go. We already locked the doors. All right, so uh, until, until service is over, you're, you're stuck right here. You got to put up with me. Let's look at it for a second because we think, we look at this word uh, passions and we think one thing. It's not, in English, we kind of lose the, the original intent of this. How many have heard the, the words, the passion of Christ? You ever heard that before? In fact, there's a movie called that. You realize that's not talking about love or romance. It's talking about love, but not, it's not talking about in the romantic sense. It's actually talking about the suffering of Christ. That's because this particular word, in this particular verse, it's called passions. But if you uh, do a little search in your concordance and you find all the places this Greek word gets used, the great majority of time, and by the great majority, I mean like with the exception of one or two times, the rest of the times it, it is this word, suffering. You must crucify your suffering. And your lust. Now, the only thing about lust, what we're actually talking about is another word, appetites. It's appetites. So I want to take that and just break it down for a minute because we need to crucify some things in our life because that's the cost of winning. That's what it's going to take to get the award. That's what it's going to take to receive the crown that will never perish. What are we suffering from? What are you suffering? Yes, things that make you ache inside. Things that make you tremble with fear. Things that make you worry and fret. Things that take up your time and your mind. The thing that's always on your mind that ain't Jesus. What is that? That's your suffering. Maybe it's your money. 
Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's something to do with your health or some situation in your family or uh, something going on at school. Maybe it's something from the past. It's a, a, some kind of failure, some kind of regret, and you just, it, you, it just gnaws at you all the time. Maybe, maybe every day you turn on the news and you start to watch the news and you see everything that's going on in the world. You see political division here and racial division there and people arguing about this and people arguing about that. And you see wars and rumors of wars and it just, it just brings you down. It causes you to suffer. You think, what kind of world am I raising my kids in? What kind of world am I living in? I want to go find an island and just live there. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I get transparent? I'm sorry. There's things that we just suffer with. And we've got to crucify it. We've got to crucify our suffering. Wow. Because some of these things, some of, some of them you need. Like you need money. You need your health. Right? You, you, need, there's thing, you need a good family situation at home. You, you need to go to school. You need a good job. You need those things. And then some things are just way outside your control. And so we've got to crucify our suffering. The way that we do that is to just to lean into Jesus Christ. And to, to not just say that we're giving it to him, but to, to really believe that, that he's got us. And, to, get, and to, to let that thing be crucified and killed in us. It, and it goes like something like this. If it's something that you need... For example, you just need to know what Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 33. Jesus talking about what kind of, don't worry about what kind of clothes you're going to wear. Don't worry about the food that you need. Don't worry about the needs of life. Your, your father sees it and knows that you need it. This is what he says, Matthew 6 and 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, seek first Jesus Christ and doing things the right way and the way he wants you to do it. And if you'll live his way, what's going to happen? All these things will be added to you. You will not lack. You will not lack. You, you will have what you need to eat. You will have the money that you need. You will have the resources you need. You'll have the relationships you need if you'll put his kingdom first. If, you will, if you'll let things come out of your you're suffering that you're just trying to hold on to. I'm trying to solve this. I don't, you know, some, why is it so hard to let go of that? I don't know. But we just we want to have control. Just acknowledge it's his. He, he's going to meet my needs. He's not going to let me go begging for bread. He's not going to fail me. He's going to provide for me. It's his words. Matthew 6 and 33. If you have a red letter edition in your Bible, it's in red because Jesus said it. If it's something you need, he's going to provide it. If it's out of your control... And so many things are. So many things happen in the world that we have, we have nothing to do with them. There's nothing we can do about them. And yet it bothers us. It worries us. We suffer from it. Look at what Jesus said in John 16. Again, the words of Jesus Christ. In John 16, he's talking to his disciples. He says, look, you're going to go through trouble. You're going to have persecution. There's going to be, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. All kinds of things are going to happen in the world. But look at verse 33. I said all this to you that in me you may have peace. I told you all this stuff is going to happen. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So if it's something that you're suffering from, it, and something, because it's something you need, understand he's going to provide it. If it's something that's out of your control, understand it's in his control. And you have got to find a way to crucify that suffering, to end it. I, I believe you're going to provide for me. I know you're going to provide for me. And I know that it's in your control. I'm going to put my trust in you. We've got to crucify it. Because what will it do? It'll just drag you down. It'll keep you from running your race like you can. It'll keep you out of the main event. And then it says we also need to sacrifice, we need to crucify our lusts. Now, when we think lusts, uh, we immediately go to things like sexual desire. That, that's a, it does fit in the category because lust is really about appetite, and that's an appetite that we all have. And really what appetites are about is a chemical reaction in our brain that we become addicted to. We, we learn that this feels good, I enjoyed that, and so your brain goes, do more of that. 
So you get this little dopamine hit and you get wired. Your brain gets wired to go for that all the time. And it could be in the area of sexual desire. It could also be things that uh, are like drugs, things that you get addicted to. And when we think drugs, we think like, okay, cocaine and, and meth and fentanyl and all that. that. Yes, that's part of it. But it also could be things like alcohol that, uh, that you get hooked on, uh, nicotine that's got your body bound. It could be caffeine that you just can't function without. It could be food that you go to anytime you feel a certain way. If I'm happy, I eat. If I'm sad, I eat. If I hurt, I eat. It's like because it just gives you that little dopamine hit. It could be any of those things. Uh, it could also be, talking about our appetites that we have in our flesh, it could also be chasing after material possessions. And this shows up in different ways. Sometimes it's, you know, I've always got to have the latest phone, always got to have the latest technology, always got to, I don't want to miss out on anything. That's just, that's, that's just my thing. I got to have more of that. Uh, I've, you know, I've always got to wear the nicest clothes. I've, uh, in fact, I, I had some clothes that I bought last month, though it's not good enough anymore. I need some more clothes. You know, it's just like you, that's it. You, it's, it could be your house. I have a nice house, but I can't stop thinking about my next one. And everything that I do is just around that. What's my next house going to be like? Well, I can't wait to get out of this house and get that. You know, enjoy the blessing that God has given you, you know? And don't let things grab your mind like that. Is it wrong to have a new phone? No. Is it wrong to wear new clothes? No. Is it wrong to have a nice house? No. It is wrong to let those things absorb you and to be, that's all you're thinking about. That's the only thing you've got. Uh, it could be something as simple as, you know, you're, you're pursuing a little dopamine hit from those likes on Facebook. You post stuff, it's like, look how cute I look today. And it's the same pose you did yesterday and the 47 days before that. We know what you look like. You were cute 47 days ago. You're still cute, but you need more people to click like to tell you because you're hooked on it. It could just be that you seek comfort and neutrality. It's like, you know what? I just want to go neutral. I just want to coast. I just want to, I just want to veg out. And so I find myself in front of YouTube or Netflix and uh, uh, playing video games or scrolling on social media endlessly and aimlessly and just going. And again, is it wrong to watch something on YouTube? No. Is it wrong to watch a movie on Netflix? Depends on the movie. Uh, is it wrong to uh, play video games? No. Is it wrong to get on on social media? I hope not. I'm on there a lot. But am I hooked on it? Can I, can I live? Do I have control over it? Or does it have control over me? See, this is the difference. And so when, when Paul's talking about it, you need to crucify your suffering and your appetites. In other words, some of these things in your life, it's not that they're bad by themselves. It's just they need to be reoriented into their proper position. Uh, and some of us need to receive freedom from, from some things that we're bound from. That's really what he's getting down to. Some of these things are not under subjection to Christ, and they need to be. All things in my life must be subject to Jesus Christ. Period. Every thing. You say, wow, that sounds like a lot of work. No, it sounds like a crucifixion. That's a little uncomfortable. Crucifixion is uncomfortable. That sounds like work. You know, it is kind of a laborious process to keep something that doesn't want to be crucified, crucified. I don't know if I can do that. Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard to, to put down the remote and, and pray instead. It, it's, it's, so, it's so difficult to control my bodily desires. It's, it's, so, it's so difficult to, to give him my suffering. It's so hard to do that. I don't, I don't think I can do that. Well, let me give you a reality check today. Hebrews 12 and 4. I know you came for a reality check, didn't you? Oh, you didn't? Well, you get one. All right, here we go. Hebrews 12 and 4. This is, uh, the writer says it, in your struggle against sin, because what we're talking about, we're talking about suffering we won't let go of. We're talking about appetites we won't let go of. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Oh, I didn't realize we're supposed to go that far. If need be. If need be. Because this, you do your little Bible study when you get home. You can read through Hebrews chapter 11. And read through Hebrews chapter 11, and it's the story of all the heroes of faith. And it sounds really good. By faith they did this, by faith they did that. And you get down to the end of Hebrews 11, you start finding some other places where people started getting killed 
for the sake of God. They started giving their lives and shedding their blood. And then he follows up in the very next chapter here, just a few verses later, he says, so you look at all that and you realize you haven't struggled against sin to the point where you've died yet. You haven't been, had your blood shed yet. You, you haven't gotten to the level of the heroes of faith yet. So I don't know what you're really complaining about. Nobody's asking you to put your head on the chopping block just yet. Okay? Now, <clears throat> consider, for example, the disciples of Jesus. And the disciples of Jesus, this is personally for me one of the big reasons why I believe what I believe about the Bible and about Jesus. Okay, I'll be honest with you, uh, there are some things in the Bible that if you just told me that, I would look at you and go, mm, I don't know. That's kind of hard to believe. I need some proof. Anybody ever feel that way about things that you read? Okay, yeah, I'm just being honest with you, okay? Now, one of the big reasons I believe in the Bible, in Jesus, is because of the history of his disciples, the people that walked with him. Now watch this. The disciples are the ones who heard Jesus teaching. Three and a half years, they followed him. They saw his prayer life and his devotion and all of that. Saw how he loved people, cared for people. They saw his miracles. They listened to him explain how he was going to be killed and buried, but they would see him again. And then they watched him die on a cross excruciatingly. And then, three days later, they saw him resurrected. And for 40 days, he taught them and appeared to them and disappeared and appeared and disappeared and explained to them and opened their understanding of Scripture. They saw him ascend up to heaven in a cloud. And again, if you were to tell me that 2,000 years ago, somebody was dead for three days and then they got up and walked around and then floated up to heaven on a cloud, I might just say, mm, I don't know about that. Never seen that before. I don't think that's really physically possible. And yet, we have these men who said it happened. Now, watch what happened after this because they went to the city of Jerusalem like Jesus had told them to do as he was ascending and they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They spoke in languages they didn't know. They started the church, okay? And all that, by the way, still happens today. And they began to preach about Jesus and the fact that they saw him die, saw him resurrected, that they had been filled with the Holy Spirit and now they were he was getting ready to come back. And they began to preach this way. And they did not get rich. They got famous, but the wrong kind. They became infamous. They were hunted. They didn't get to enjoy the comforts of fame. They lived in constant danger. They were always on the run lest somebody imprison them or try to kill them or hurt them. And here's the thing. They chose that. They chose to live that way. They could have said, I'm just going to go back to being a fisherman. Jesus died. That was a fun run for three and a half years. I don't want to get hurt anymore. Didn't really happen. Explain it all away. Go back to fishing. Go back to tax collecting. Go back to doing whatever I was doing. I'll just live my life. And everybody can just leave me alone. That's not what they did. Instead, they began to preach and they began to reach and they began to declare, this is what we have seen, even when people wanted to kill them. And watch this. This is what happened to the disciples. First of all, out of all the disciples, John was the only one to live to old age. Part of that was because he got exiled to a, an island. Peter was crucified upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Put me upside down. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. James, the son of Zebedee, was run through with a sword. Philip was also crucified. Bartholomew was flayed alive. You know what that is? It means they peel your skin off until you die. Thomas was speared in India. Matthew was killed in Ethiopia somehow. James, son of Alphaeus, was stoned and clubbed. Thaddeus was killed in Persia. Simon the Zealot got cut in half with a saw. 
Matthias was stoned and or beheaded. All because they said it really happened. And no matter what you say to us, no matter what you do to us, no matter what you threaten us with, it happened. And we're going to receive a reward. They knew what they saw Jesus do. They knew the experience they had with his spirit. And they knew the reward that he had promised them. And they, because they knew that, because they believed that, because they trusted that, not blindly, not because they heard it secondhand, because they saw it with their own eyes, they did not recant. They did not bow down. They did not bend to pressure. Instead of going into hiding, they went into the public and preached boldly the name of Jesus. Look, you don't do that. People, people, you, you can convince somebody to do that for a lie. Like I could, I could lie to you and be very charismatic and, and make, make you think that I was telling you the truth and, and give you some, some, people do that all the time. They die for things that were a lie or things that they thought were true. These are men that saw it. Saw it. That's huge. Then the apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul comes, in, comes onto the scene and, and he also was imprisoned and on the run. Uh, he, was a, he was a Pharisee. He had a, a career as a lawyer. Everything was looking up for him. And yet, this is the life he chose to, leave, or to lead. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, he gives you just a couple little highlights. He said, look, because of my faith, five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes less one. 39 stripes that were laid on my back five times. I did the math. That's 195 stripes. 195 scars he would have on his back. Three times beaten with rods, and once I was even stoned. And that's before you get into the shipwrecks and all the stuff that people didn't do to him. That was just stuff that people did to him because he was preaching about Jesus. Why would he do that? Because he encountered Jesus for real. Look, people, people, don't, do, people don't say things happened and then go through these extremes if they didn't really happen. They just don't. Would you? No, you wouldn't. But what if you really saw him? What, what, if, what if you saw Jesus resurrected? And he said, these things are going to happen to you, but then you're going to be with me, and here's all the rewards you're going to receive. Then what would you do? Well, you'd do what they did. The apostle Paul went on to be imprisoned and beheaded. All these, these men, these believers, these that saw Jesus, they, they shed their blood, they gave their life for what they experience with God. And we, we get uncomfortable whenever the preacher says you need to control your sexual desires. <gasps> Don't you know the culture we live in? It's okay now. No, it's not. Control yourself. Or when the, when the preacher says you don't need to be getting high, you don't need to be getting drunk, you need to be full of the Holy Ghost instead. <gasps> or if I, if I say, well, you know, you need to play less video games and spend more time in the Word. Or you need to turn off Netflix and spend a little time in prayer. And you're like, oh, I don't know. That's difficult. You need to come to church faithfully. Oh, I don't know. It's easy to sleep in on Sundays. Let's go Old Testament on you for just a second. Jer Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, this is the Lord speaking to the prophet, by the way, because even the prophets have issues. The prophet was complaining to God, look at all these difficult things I'm having to deal with. All the wicked are prospering, and I don't understand why. I don't get it. And God said to Jeremiah, if you have raced with men on foot, and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? In other words, if you can't handle the simple things right now, what are you going to do when it gets tough? If your faith can't handle getting up on Sundays and going to church for, you know, a little while on a Sunday morning once a week, what are you going to do when life really happens? If you, if you can't handle uh, people treating you bad at your job or at your school, what are you going to do when they want to put you in jail for telling them the truth? If you can't, if you, can't uh, you know, serve God because it's a little difficult when you got a cold, what are you going to do when you're laying on your deathbed? 
If you can't run with the footmen and not get wearied, how are you going to run with the horses, Jeremiah? You see, Christians don't get a free pass through life's difficulties. I'm sorry. I would love to stand up here and tell you, when you start serving Jesus, everything is rosy. You immediately lose those 20 pounds you were trying to lose. You immediately, your gray hair turns back to its original color. Uh, you immediately, there's a million dollars that appears in your bank account. Like I would love to, I'd love to tell you that. That's not what happens. Instead, you go through life and you still go through those difficulties, but it, it's different. Watch this. Philippians 4 and 12. Again, the Apostle Paul went through all the things that I told you. He says this, I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. We think we should only abound. But Paul says, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound too. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, we like that last verse. I can do all things. through. That has nothing to do with how it gets used. It doesn't have anything to do with throwing touchdown passes. It doesn't have anything to do with hitting home runs. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, getting a promotion at work. It doesn't have anything to do with getting good grades in school. It had nothing to do with all of that. It has to do with I know how to do well when I'm up, and I know how to be okay when things are down. I, in any season, I know how to face it because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Life doesn't get any easier when you turn to Christ, but it does get more hopeful. Because you have something you're shooting for. It has something you're going to receive. It has a, a reward that is imperishable and uncorruptible that lies in front of you. Uh, two reasons that, it, that life gets more hopeful as Christians. Number one, we learn how strong he is in our weakness. When we get weak, we feel low. We, we know that he provides for us and he carries us through. That's the first thing. He gets strong in our weakness. The second is we start looking at our reward. That's the title of the series, Trophies and Crowns. So let me talk about the reward for a minute. Oh, because I, I kind of, I don't know, I've been a little heavy on you today, but I want you to understand that you're going to go through that and you deal with that and you choose that because there is a reward that awaits you on the other side. Okay, let me, let, let me get, let's get this thought in you today. We don't, we don't want to go to heaven in comfort. We don't want to go to heaven just untouched, unfazed, unscathed by life. No, I'm not going to go to heaven just coasting. This is how I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven totally spent. Poured out. No dreams that I didn't try to pursue. No books that I didn't try to write. Nobody that I didn't try to love and to serve with everything that I could. Poured out. I want to go to heaven tested, scarred. Maybe I'm walking with a limp. And when I get to heaven, I get this idea that you're going to just run from this life into heaven. No, I might just kind of be dragging my heels just trying to get there. But in a moment, in an instant, when my, when my feet hit the other side, uh, my limp goes away and my scars suddenly heal. And, and the body that was weak gets transformed into a new body in a moment, in an instant of an eye when I see my Jesus. Well, then I become victorious. I want to go to heaven victorious. I don't want to go just, you know, in a hammock. Like nothing ever happened. I, 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 want, to, I want to earn my reward. I want to, I, when I get there, I want to have poured everything out. And I may limp to the other side, but I'm, I'm going to dance on the streets of gold. I can promise you in my, in my new, I can't really dance that well in this body, but when I get over there, I, you better watch me cut a rug. Uh-huh. I never could figure out how to do the move where you lay on your back and spin around, but I'm going to do it over there. I promise. I promise. <laughs> yeah. The world, the world celebrates uh, spending your blood, sweat, and tears for something that is temporary. But you and I, we choose to give it all to obtain something imperishable. And we can exhaust everything in us. We can sacrifice that way because I know everything in this body, all the desires that I have, all the appetites that I have, all the suffering I have, it's all temporary. I can crucify it and kill it, get it, get it out, out of my life because I'm going to get a brand new body, a perfect body. And to go on that body, I'm going to get a robe of righteousness. That's Revelation 19 and 8. Uh, the robe of righteousness is a white robe. It's a physical manifestation of all the works we've accomplished for Christ. I'm going to get a harp. A harp. 
You go, do you know how to play a harp? I do not, but I will when I get over there. And it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be beautiful. Revelation 15 and 2 tells me that. I'm going to get a, a crown, imperishable, incorruptible, and this crown represents eternal life. That's James 1 and 12, Revelation 2 and 10. Uh, it represents righteousness, 2 Timothy 4 and 8. The crown that I'm going to receive has glory attached to it, like you accomplished something, you made your way through Look at all the things that you did for Christ. There's glory in it, 1 Peter 5 and 4. And so I'm going to get a body, I'll get a robe, I'll get a harp. Well, that all makes sense. Uh, you know, I get a new body, great. I get to, you know, touch and take and spend all the, all the things that you can do with the body. That's great. I get a robe, so I don't have to walk around unclothed. That's good. We're going to be there for eternity. Uh, I get a harp. That's, that's cool. Give me something to do. Awesome. But what do I need to do with the crown? What do, I, what do I need a crown for up there? Well, we get a clue from this mysterious group called the elders. There are 24 elders in heaven around the throne. We don't know who they are. Some great discussion about who they might be. We can talk about that later. But uh, look at it in Revelation 4 and 10. They give us a clue what you do with crowns in heaven. It says this, Revelation 4 and 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne. That's Jesus. And they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. That's what you do with your crown. You cast it before the throne and you say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. So when we get to heaven, we're going to find that our bodies were made so that we could live with him forever. Our robes were designed to attract him like a bride would be attractive to her husband. Our harps were built to praise him, but our crowns will be used to worship him. Let's stand in the room right now because well, as we go into a time of worship, this is, this is what you need to, you need to understand. That when you, when you start to worship God, you're fulfilling your destiny. Right. You're fulfilling everything that you're going to be when you get over there. You're going to have a new body. You're going to be clothed in righteousness. Yeah, you're going to have a, a harp that you're given to make beautiful praise unto God. But you're also going to be given a crown uh, of glory. And you're going to take that glory and you're going to give it to Him forever and ever and ever ever. And right now, right now, as you begin to choose, I, I want that. I, I, I want that. I, I want a new body. I, I want that robe of righteousness. I want that harp so I can sing those praises to God. And I, I want that crown to put at his feet and worship him. That's what I, I want that more than anything. And as you begin to desire that and you begin to worship him here and now, uh, you, you enter into a, a, a sensation of perfection, a sensation of completeness and wholeness that happens when you worship God. And when you get so entirely caught up in worship, what you're really doing is you're tasting heaven. That's what you're doing. So I want you to, I want you to do that today. I want you to plug into worship. We're going to go into a time of worship. I want you to do it because here's, here's the truth. I want, you, I want you to hear it. I know I preached some hard things to you today. I know, I know, I'm sorry. If you're new, come back next week. It'll be better. You are going to make it. We are going to go to heaven together. We're, we're going. Thick or thin, hell or high water. We're not going by the skin of our teeth. We're going by his grace and his power. So I want you to have a moment with God right now because I know it can be difficult to feel like I've got to sacrifice my suffering. I need to sacrifice. I need to crucify some desires and some appetites. Yeah, you, you can do that. You can do it right now, right here. There's a supernatural presence of God in this room that's given you the ability to do it. I want you to plug into worship and let him work on you. Let him work on you right now. And just let's, let's all together just say, you know what? I will make it to heaven. I will crucify what I need to crucify. I will put under control what needs to be controlled. I will do what it takes to get to heaven. I will get my reward. I want to get my new body. I want to get my robe. I want to get my harp. I want to get my crown. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Let's go into worship right now. If you need prayer for anything, we want to pray with you. You step out of the aisle or step out of the seat into the aisle. That'll be our cue. Somebody will come and pray with you. But I really want you just to worship today and let the Lord begin to work on you and supernaturally strengthen you and prepare you to enter into heaven.
to enter into heaven to receive your reward. Would you worship him right now? Would you just would you be the worship team today? Would you worship him for who, who he is? And let's let the Lord work on us in Jesus' name. We're gonna make it.